Hey, it's uh, good to be with you today. Um, actually, I have a good friend with me too. Uh, Chris Chris Surratt is with me, and uh, Chris, uh, uh, you've been at two great churches: Seacoast Church, where your brother was the senior pastor, uh, and uh, Cross uh, Point, most recently in Nashville. Uh, but for those that aren't familiar with your story, can you give a little bit of your backstory real quick? Sure. Yeah, it's good to be here, Tony. Thanks for having me. And um, yeah, I. Uh, grew up in the South, grew up in Houston as a preacher's kid, and so kind of started in the ministry in my dad's church, uh, was a student pastor for a few years, and then uh, uh, was invited by my brother to join a new church plant in Charleston, South Carolina called Seacoast, and so joined uh, the staff there early on uh, in the first few years of the church and started out in the worship arts department as a uh, music director and thought that I was going to be, a you know, do that for the rest of my life and you know how that happens with ministry and the mm -hmm. church grew and uh, eventually we started multi-sites and started a few sites and so i um, uh, stepped out and planted a campus in greenville south carolina uh, for seacoast and uh, was a campus pastor there for five years and then had the opportunity to come to nashville uh, where country music is the king and uh, joined a great church cross point church with Pete Wilson, and uh, was on staff there on the executive team for about almost six years, and then just recently stepped off staff to consult and coach, and uh, yeah, so that's kind of where I am now. And now part of the Unstuck group, which is one of the reasons yep. why we wanted to talk with you today. Um, recently, we went back and looked at all the churches that we've worked with over the last couple of years through a strategic planning process, because we were curious to see, are there any common challenges that the churches uh, face. And one of the top five challenges was around this topic of small groups. And Chris, I know this is a particular passion area of you, uh, for you. In fact, you, you have a book coming out uh, on this very topic. Um, we'll, we'll get back to the book at the end of our conversation, but does it surprise you, Chris, that small groups were one of the core issues that churches are wrestling with? No, it doesn't surprise me at all. In fact, with when we looked at the core issues, it was also discipleship was a huge one. And I think a lot of churches kind of lump discipleship, small groups, you know, that's kind of their path for discipleship. So I would say that it isn't even just small groups, but it's how do we disciple people? What medium do we use um, for that? And for a lot of churches, they've decided that small groups is the best path. And uh, I go into a lot of churches. I coach a lot of churches on how to do small groups. And I've seen, you know, almost every model that you can possibly see when it comes to groups. And I think that's one of the big issues um, why churches struggle with groups is the expectations of what groups are and what they can be. You know, I think a lot of churches uh, take kind of the just the, the net approach when it comes to groups and they want groups to be everything. They want it to uh, be a discipleship maker. They want it to be a social club. They want it to be, um, you know, team building. They, they, they don't know exactly what they want it to be, and so they try to make it everything. And so I think uh, churches struggle with just defining what a small group is, what is it going to look like, what are the expectations, and then how do we fund that and how do we resource that. And so I, I, that's kind of what I see from church to church is they're having a hard time really grasping. We know we need small groups because we want our people to, you know, be in smaller groups within our church, but we don't know what they should look like or what the expectations are for them. So uh, as you as you begin to work with churches and they take this on as a core strategy for growth, not only spiritual growth, but numerical growth. What are, what are some of the key mistakes or key challenges that you find churches running into that really causes them to get stuck in this area of small groups? Sure. Well, I think, I, I think there, there's a few things. I think one is kind of the, the extreme of we're just going to let them do anything they want. And so that's kind of the ultimate free market system, which I, I like the free market system, but I think you know, uh, people need guidance and they need some guardrails uh, on where they're going. And so if you're just kind of saying, we're going to do small groups, they can do whatever they want. They're not going to get where you want them to go. 
Um, so that's the one side. And think, the other side is the churches that say, you know what, we're afraid of what small groups can become. You know, they can go south on us really quickly. And so we're going to control them. And we're going to only let them study this one thing. And they're, they're going to have to do A, B, and C, or they're not a group. And so I think there's somewhere in between that's really kind of a happy medium where we, we have some control because I believe that our leaders and our, our, our people need some guidance on, you know, how do I get discipled and what are some processes and what are the on-ramps, what are the off-ramps. But then I think there's also that we want you to uh, be passionate about what you're talking about, what you're studying. And so we want it to fit into the flow of who you are. And so I think there's a balance with that, that a lot of churches struggle to find that. Um, also, I think another thing that's, that's difficult is when the senior pastor, the senior leader is not completely bought into small groups. And what I mean by that is, you know, most pastors will talk about small groups because they think it's a good thing and they, they want their church to be involved in it. But if they're not talking about their group, you know, if they're not talking from their experience and saying, you know, my group, um, this is what's happening. This is how I get discipled through my group. Then I don't think people are really going to jump into it because small groups is uh, not the easiest thing to commit to. You know, it's, it's much easier to go to a large group meeting, maybe a Monday night, you know, big prayer meeting or something like that. But you're asking people to step into maybe a stranger's home with about 12 to 14 uh, people and, and there's gonna be some accountability. And so if the lead pastor, senior pastor is not leading the way on that with his own group, talking about it constantly, um, it's gonna be tough for a church to really buy into it. Chris, you and I had a little conversation before the interview today, and I think you think I'm not a fan of small groups, which... I don't know where that came from. Maybe black <laughs> and, But know, I tell I, you, I do have a couple pet peeves, and here's one of them. It feels like there's a flavor of the month when it comes to small group ministries in the churches that, uh, that I get connected with. And frankly, I think part of the, the challenge I see with churches getting traction around small groups is the fact that they're constantly changing their strategy uh, every six to 12 months. So uh, what, what kind of coaching can you give churches as it relates to finding a strategy and then sticking with it? No, I think that's a very good point, Tony. I think a lot of churches, um, you know, whatever church is kind of the church at the moment when it comes to, and it's not just small groups, but it's really any, any ministry. I see it a lot with student ministry. You know, a lot of churches struggle getting student ministry going, so they'll jump from model to model to model. And it's, it's especially true with small groups. You know, for a while, uh, Willow Creek, uh, the neighborhood kind of uh, small group system was all the rage. And so, Tons of churches jumped onto that, and then all of a sudden, uh, Saddleback, uh, with kind of their host model, they jumped onto that. And then North Point, with the closed, you know, 12 to 24 month groups, they jumped onto that. And I, I think it's with any ministry, consistency is the key. You know, if you're wanting people to uh, really buy into it and kind of uh, dedicate time to it, they can't change in the next six months or 12 months, or you're just going to confuse them. They're going to give up. And they're going to go to what's easier, which is not getting involved in a small group. And so I, I think you're right. I, I, I think in a lot of things, we're confusing people when it comes to how we want them to get involved in the church. How do we want them to serve? And how do we want them to get discipled? I think we make it complicated. And really, Jesus made it easy. And that's what we need to look at when we look at our small group system. Does it fit our DNA? Does it fit our culture? And I always think you need to tweak. I mean, there are some things that you, you're going to discover along the way. But if you're just changing your entire system, you know, drawing new boxes on the whiteboard every year, uh, people are going to give up. They're going to get tired and they're going to give up and you're going to lose momentum. So uh, particularly for growing churches, it appears that one of the key pinch points is leadership development. Mm -hmm. Now, before we talk about developing additional coaches or group leaders, I first want to hear your perspective on what's what's the wiring of the person, whether it's a staff person or a volunteer, that you would want overseeing the entire small group strategy. What what should churches be looking for to identify who that person should be? Hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's important. I get a ton of calls and emails saying we're looking for you know a small groups person or. A, discipleship director or whatever it's called at your church. And I, I think there are some key things. I think one is 
Um, you really want a good systems person. Um, I think that, you know, when it comes to designing a small group ministry, uh, systems are going to be a huge part of that. And so I think you want something, somebody who's not afraid of systems. Um, but then you also want somebody that, that, and this is sometimes the opposite, but I think some people have both, is that you want a, a people person. You want somebody that's a shepherd that really loves people because if they're just drawn in on a whiteboard, when it comes to community and they don't love people, it's going to be a struggle. And they have to be willing to kind of bend those lines and, and redraw and, and, and kind of fit to where people are. And so I think you need a little bit of both. Um, and you need somebody who's an ideator. You need somebody who's kind of thinking ahead, um, that's, that's uh, dreaming about how can we get people into our groups in a new way, in an easy way, easy and obvious on wraps. And so it's, it's a tough position to fill, to be honest with you. Um, and I think once you find the right person, um, resource them. That's where it gets bogged down in a lot of churches. Small groups become kind of the side ministry. You know, there's not all the, the fancy stats like you get on a Sunday morning with a kids ministry. We had this many people come to our, our, our kids service this morning. or We had this many people do our missions outreach. Small groups are kind of behind the scenes. It's a discipleship um, path. And so it doesn't get resourced. And so I think that's key when you're looking at it. Resource your small group director, resource your small groups, make them a focal point of your church and they'll have a chance to succeed. So then uh, once we've identified the leader of the ministry, uh, what have you found as far as uh, great benchmarks, uh, great strategies to continue to raise up more group leaders, coaches, whatever your structure might look like, the folks that are going to help lead this initiative? Yeah, I think um, a lot of times uh, churches get stuck on how high they're going to raise the bar for leadership. Um, and you can look at it in different ways. But um, if you're raising the bar so high for leadership, like, you know, they have to go through our 101, 201, 301. Um, there's a, a, you know, a three month uh, training that they have to do before they're going to start a group. You're going to you're going to um, shrink the box for uh, how many groups you're going to have, how many people can get into groups. If you want to broaden that box, you just have to lower the bar. And so I think there's different ways to do that. And, uh, you know, you can explore the host group strategy that Saddleback has where anybody can start a group. You know, it doesn't even matter if they, they're Christian or not, or you can have a little bit of higher bar. But I think you have to just look at it and say, okay, let, let's, let's go to the end in mind first. How many groups do we need to start for, a, you know, a good percentage of our people to be in groups? Okay, we know how many groups we have. All right, how many leaders do we need? Okay, we figure that out. And then how many coaches do we need to care for those leaders? Because that's where we forget, and, and a lot of times we don't resource enough, is those leaders need soul care. And so you kind of back, you, you start with the end in mind, kind of back up, and then you figure out, okay, how high – do we need to set the bar? Can we set the bar to have that many leaders to reach this many people? And you kind of go from there on it. All right. So I don't know if you meant it or if maybe we just disagree on this, but uh, I don't know that in a church context that would have a non-Christian leading a group. Yeah, I, I mean, that's that's a, a debate. And like I said, there's a lot of things that go into that. I mean, if you're going to do, and, and I, I talk about it in my book, but if you're going to do a host group strategy, where you're going to have a non-group, um, you know, when we did it at Crosspoint, we didn't call it a leader, we called it a host. And we said, okay, we would love to give you the curriculum. And then you invite your friends, you invite your neighbors, you invite the people you work with. Um, you know, we're not going to put people into your group necessarily, but it's going to, you know, we're going to help resource you and just give you curriculum. And it's kind of a starting point. It's almost a new front door for the church, hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. All right, Chris, you mentioned your book. So tell us a little bit about that. And uh, uh, that, that way we can encourage some folks to pick that up. Sure. It's uh, called Small Groups for the Rest of Us, uh, how to design your small group system to reach the fringes. And kind of the big idea behind the book is uh, most churches uh, are having a hard time getting beyond like 40, 50% of their attendance in groups. And we're missing some large 
uh, groups of people with our current strategies. And so I just kind of outlined some ideas, host groups are one of them, how we can reach beyond just those 50% who would naturally just do anything that we ask them to do. Um, and how do we get them into community? Because I feel like uh, life change happens best within the context of community, like Andy Stanley says. And so if we're going to get 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 percent of our people into groups, we're going to have to try some new strategies. And so that's what the group is or the book is about. And uh, it'll be out the uh, end of September, September 29th. Well, at the Unstuck Group, our mission is pretty simple. We're just trying to help churches get unstuck. And if you find yourself stuck in this area of small groups strategy, small groups ministry, we'd love to connect with you. So just visit, visit the unstuckgroup.com, click the start button, and that will start a conversation so that we can help you take your next steps. Chris, thanks again for joining us today. Thanks, Tony.